John C. Calhoun from Wikipedia, the Free Encyclopedia. John Caldwell Calhoun, March 18, 1782 through March 31, 1850, was an American statesman and political theorist from South Carolina, and the seventh Vice President of the United States from 1825 to 1832. He is remembered for strongly defending slavery and for advancing the concept of minority party rights in politics, which he did in the context of protecting the interests of the white South when it was outnumbered by Northerners. He began his political career as a nationalist, modernizer, and proponent of a strong national government and protective tariffs. In the late 1820s, his views changed radically, and he became a leading proponent of states' rights, limited government, nullification, and opposition to high tariffs. He saw Northern acceptance of these policies as the only way to keep the South in the Union. His beliefs and warnings heavily influenced the South's secession from the Union in 1860-1861. through 1861. Calhoun began his political career with election to the House of Representatives in 1820. As a prominent leader of the Warhawk faction, Calhoun strongly supported the War of 1812 to defend American honor against British infractions of American independence and neutrality during the Napoleonic Wars. He then served as Secretary of War under James Monroe, and in this position reorganized and modernized the War Department. Calhoun was a candidate for the presidency in the 1824 election. After failing to gain support, he let his name be put forth as a candidate for vice president. The Electoral College elected Calhoun for vice president by an overwhelming majority. He served under John Quincy Adams and continued under Andrew Jackson, who defeated Adams in the election of 1828. Calhoun had a difficult relationship with Jackson, primarily due to the nullification crisis and the petticoat affair. In contrast with his previous nationalism, Calhoun vigorously supported South Carolina's right to nullify tariff legislation he believed unfairly favored the North, putting him into contact with Unionists such as Jackson. In 1832, with only a few months remaining in his second term, he resigned as vice president and entered the Senate. He sought the Democratic nomination for presidency in 1844, but lost a surprise nominee, James K. Polk, who went on to become president. Calhoun served as Secretary of State under John Tyler from 1844 to 1845. As Secretary of State, he supported the annexation of Texas as a means to extend the slave power, and helped settle the Oregon boundary dispute with Britain. He then returned to the Senate, where he opposed the Mexican-American War, the Wilmot Proviso, and the Compromise of 1850 before his death in 1850. Calhoun often served as a virtual party independent, who various aligned, as needed, with Democrats and Whigs. Later in life, Calhoun became known as the Cast Iron Man for his rigid defense of white Southern beliefs and practices. His concept of republicanism emphasized approval of slavery and minority rights, as particularly embodied by the southern states. He owned dozens of slaves in Fort Hill, South Carolina. Calhoun also asserted that slavery, rather than being a necessary evil, was a positive good, benefiting both slaves and slave owners. To protect minority rights against minority rule, he called for a concurrent majority whereby the minority could sometimes block proposals that it felt infringed on their liberties. To this end, Calhoun supported states' rights and nullification, through which states could declare null and void federal laws that they viewed as unconstitutional. Calhoun was one of the great triumvirate, or immortal trio, of congressional leaders, along with congressional colleagues Daniel Webster and Henry Clay. In 1957, a Senate committee headed by Senator John F. Kennedy selected Calhoun as one of the five greatest United States Senators of all time. Section 1 Early Life John Caldwell Calhoun was born in Abbeville District, South Carolina on March 18, 1782, the fourth child of Patrick Calhoun, 1727-1796, through 1796, and his wife Martha Caldwell. Patrick's father, also named Patrick Calhoun, 
had joined the Scotch-Irish immigration movement from County Donegal to southwestern Pennsylvania. After the death of the elder Patrick in 1741, the family moved to southwestern Virginia. Following the defeat of British General Edward Braddock and the, at the Battle of Mangahala in 1755, the family, fearing Indian attacks, moved to South Carolina in 1756. Patrick Calhoun belonged to the Calhoun clan in the tight-knit Scotch-Irish community on the southern frontier. He was known as an Indian fighter and an ambitious surveyor, farmer, planter, and politician, being a member of the South Carolina legislature. As a Presbyterian, he stood opposed to an Anglican elite based in Charleston. He was a patriot in the American Revolution and opposed ratification of the federal constitution on grounds of states' rights and personal liberties. Calhoun would eventually adopt his father's states' rights beliefs. Young Calhoun showed scholastic talent, and although schools were scarce on the Carolina frontier, he was enrolled briefly in an academy in Appling, Georgia, which soon closed. He continued his studies privately. When his father died, his brothers were away starting business careers, and so the 14-year-old Calhoun took over management of the family farm and five other farms. For four years, he simultaneously kept up his reading and his hunting and fishing. The family decided he should continue his education, and so he resumed studies at the academy after it reopened. With financing from his brothers, he went to Yale College in Connecticut in 1802. For the first time in his life, Calhoun encountered serious, advanced, well-organized intellectual dialogue that could shape his mind. Yale was dominated by President Timothy Dwight, a Federalist who became his mentor. Dwight's brilliance entranced and sometimes repelled Calhoun. Biographer John Niven says, Calhoun admired Dwight's extemporaneous sermons, his seemingly encyclopedic knowledge, and his awesome mastery of the classics, of the tenets of Calvinism, and of metaphysics. No one, he thought, could explicate the language of John Locke's with such clarity. Dwight repeatedly denounced Jeffersonian democracy, and Calhoun challenged him in class. Dwight could not shake Calhoun's commitment to republicanism. Young man, reported Dwight, your talents are of a high order and might justify you for any station, but I deeply regret that you do not love sound policies better than sophistry. You seem to possess a most unfortunate bias for error. Dwight also expounded on the sad strategy of secession from the Union as a legitimate solution for New England's disagreements with the national government. Calhoun made friends easily, read widely, and was a noted member of the debating society of Brothers of U in Unity. He graduated as valedictorian in 1804. He studied law at the nation's only re real law school, Tapping Reeve Law School in Litchfield, Connecticut, where he worked with Tapping Reeve and James Gould. He was admitted to the South Carolina Bar in 1807. Biographer Margaret Coit argues that, Every principle of secession or states' rights, which Calhoun ever voiced, can be traced right back to the thinking of intellectual New England. Not the South, not slavery, but Yale College and Litchfield Law School make Calhoun a nullifier. Dwight, Reeve, and Gould could not convince the young patriot from South Carolina as to the desirability of secession, but they left no doubts in his mind as to its legality. Section 2. Personal Life in January 1811, Calhoun married Floride Banu Calhoun, a first cousin once removed. She was the daughter of wealthy United States Senator and lawyer John E. Calhoun, a leader of Charleston High Society. The couple had ten children over 18 years, Andrew Pickens Calhoun, Floride Pierre Calhoun, Jane Calhoun, Anna Maria Calhoun, Elizabeth Calhoun, Patrick Calhoun, John Caldwell Calhoun, Jr., Martha Cornelia Calhoun, James Edward Calhoun, and William Loundis Calhoun. Three of them, Flor Floride Pierre, Jane, and Elizabeth, died in infancy. Calhoun's fourth child, Anna Maria, married Thomas Green Clemson, founder of Clemson University in South Carolina. Calhoun was not openly religious. He was raised Calvinist, but was attracted to Southern varieties of Unitarianism of the sort that attracted Jefferson. Southern Unitarianism was generally less organized, 
than the very variety popular in New England. He was generally not outspoken about his religious beliefs. After his marriage, Calhoun and his wife attended the Episcopal Church, of which he was a member. In 1821, he became a founding member of All Souls Unitarian Church in Washington, D.C. Historian Merrill Peterson describes Calhoun. Intensely serious and severe, he could never write a love poem, though he often tried, because every line began with whereas. Section 3, House of Representatives. Section 3.1, War of 1812. With a base among the Irish and Scotch-Irish, Calhoun won election to the House of Representatives in 1810. He immediately became a leader of the War Hawks, along with Speaker Henry Clay of Kentucky and South Carolina Congressman William Loundis and Langdon Cheeves. Brushing aside the vehement objections of both anti-war New Englanders and arch-conservative Jeffersonians, led by John Randolph of Roanoke, they demanded war against Britain to preserve American honor and Republican virtues, which had been violated by the British refusal to recognize American shipping rights. As a member, and later acting chairman, of the Committee on Foreign Affairs, Calhoun played a major role in drafting two key documents in the push for war the Report on Foreign Relations, and the War Report of 1812. Drawing on the linguistic tradition of the Declaration of Independence, Calhoun's committee called for a declaration of war in ringing phrases, denouncing Britain's lust for power, unbounded tyranny, and mad ambition. Historian James Rourke says, These were fighting words in a war that was in large measure about insult and honor. The United States declared war on Britain on June 18th, inaugurating the War of 1812. The opening phase involved multiple disasters for American arms, as well as financial crises when the Treasury could barely pay the bills. The conflict caused economic hardship for the Americans, as the Royal Navy blockaded the ports and cut off imports, exports, and the coastal trade. Several attempted invasions of California were fiascos, but the U.S. in 1813 seized control of Lake Erie and broke the power of hostile Indians in battle such as the Battle of the Thames in California in Canada in 1813 and the Battle of Horseshoe Bend in Alabama in 1814. These Indians had, in many cases, cooperated with the British or Spanish in opposing American interests. Calhoun labored to raise troops, provide homes, speed logistics, rescue the currency, and regulate commerce to aid the war effort. One colleague hailed him as the young Hercules who carried the war on his shoulders. Disasters on the battlefield made him double his legislative efforts to overcome the obstructionism of John Randolph, Daniel Webster, and other opponents of the war. In December 1814, with the armies of Napoleon Bonaparte apparently defeated and the British invasions of New York and Baltimore thwarted, British and American diplomats signed the Treaty of Ghent. It called for a return to the borders of 1812 with no gains or losses. Before the treaty reached the Senate for ratification, and even before news of its signing reached New Orleans, a massive British invasion force was ultimately defeated in January 1815 at the Battle of New Orleans, making a national hero of General Andrew Jackson. Americans celebrated what they called a second war of independence against Britain. This led to the beginning of the era of good feelings, an era marked by the formal demise of the Federalist Party and increased nationalism. Section 4. Secretary of War and Post-War Nationalism in 1817, the deplorable state of the War Department led four men to decline offers from President James Monroe to accept the office of Secretary of War before Calhoun finally assumed the role. Calhoun took office on December 8 and served until 1825. He continued his role as a leading nationalist during the era of good feelings. He proposed an elaborate program of national reforms to the infrastructure that he believed would speed economic modernization. His first priority was an effective navy, including steam frigates, and in the second place a standing army of adequate size, and as further preparation for emergency, great permanent roads, a certain encouragement to manufacturers, and a system of internal taxation that would not collapse from a wartime shrinkage of maritime trade like custom duties. 
After the war ended in 1815, the old Republicans in Congress, with their Jeffersonian ideal ideology for economy and the federal government, sought to reduce the operations and finances of the War Department. Calhoun's political rivalry with William H. Crawford, the Secretary of the Treasury, over the pursuit of the presidency in the 1824 election complicated Calhoun's tenure as War Secretary. The general lack of military action following the war meant that a large army, such as that preferred by Calhoun, was no longer considered necessary. The Radicals, a group of strong states' rights supporters who mostly favored Crawford for president in the coming election, were inherently suspicious of large armies. Some allegedly also wanted to hinder Calhoun's own presidential aspirations for that election. Thus, on March 2, 1821, Congress passed the Reduction Act, which reduced the number of enlisted men of the Army by half, from 11,709 to 5,586, and the number of the Officer Corps by a fifth, from 680 to 540. Calhoun, though concerned, offered little protest. Later, to provide the Army with a more organized command structure, which had been severely lacking during the War of 1812, he appointed Major General Jacob Brown to a position that would later become known as Commanding General of the United States Army. As Secretary, Calhoun had responsibility for management of Indian affairs. He promoted a plan, adopted by Monroe in 1825, to preserve the sovereignty of eastern Indians by relocating them to western reservations they could control without interference from state governments. In over seven years, Calhoun supervised the negotiation and ratification of 40 treaties with Indian tribes. Calhoun opposed the invasion of Florida, launched in 1818 by General Jackson during the First Seminole War which was done without direct authorization from Calhoun or President Monroe, and in private with other cabinet members, advocated censorship of Jackson as a punishment. The United States annexed Florida from Spain in 1819 through the adam onis Treaty. A reform-minded modernizer, he attempted to institute centralization and efficiency in the Indian Department and in the Army by establishing new coastal and frontier fortifications and building military roads, but Congress either failed to respond to his reforms or responded with hostility. Calhoun's frustration with congressional inaction, political rivalries, and ideological differences spurred him to create the Bureau of Indian Affairs in 1824. The responsibilities of the Bureau were to manage treaty negotiations, schools, and trade with Indians, in addition to handling all expenditures and correspondence concerning Indian affairs. Thomas McKenney was appointed as the first head of the Bureau. Calhoun's tenure as Secretary of War witnessed the outbreak of the Missouri Crisis in December 1818, when a petition arrived from Missouri settlers seeking admission into the Union as a slave state. In response, Representative James Thomas, Jr. of New York proposed two amendments to the bill designed to restrict the spread of slavery into what would become the new state. The amendments touched off an intense debate between North and South that had some talking openly of disunion. In February 1820, Calhoun predicted to Secretary of State John Quincy Adams, a New Englander, that the Missouri issue would not produce a dissolution of the Union. But if it should, Calhoun went on, the South would of necessity be compelled to form an alliance with Great Britain. I said that would be returning to the colonial state, Adams recalled saying afterwards. According to Adams, he said, yes, pretty much, but it would be forced upon them. Section 5, Vice Presidency. Section 5.1, 1824 and 1828 elections and the Adams Presidency. Calhoun was initially a candidate for President of the United States in the election of 1824. Four other men also sought the presidency, Andrew Jackson, Adams, Crawford, and Henry Clay. Calhoun failed to win the endorsement of the South Carolina legislature, and his supporters in Pennsylvania decided to abandon his candidacy in favor of Jackson's, and instead supported him for vice president. Other states soon followed and Calhoun therefore allowed himself to become a candidate for vice president rather than president. The Electoral College elected Calhoun vice president by a landslide. He won 182 votes out of 261 electoral votes, 
while five other men received the remaining votes. No presidential candidate received a majority in the Electoral College, and the election was ultimately resolved by the House of Representatives, where Adams was declared the winner over Crawford and Jackson, who in the election had led Adams in both popular vote and electoral vote. After Clay, the Speaker of the House, was appointed Secretary of State by Adams, Jackson's supporters denounced what they considered a corrupt bargain between Adams and Clay to give Adams the presidency in exchange for Clay receiving the office of Secretary of State, the holder of which had traditionally become the next president. Calhoun also expressed some concerns, which caused friction between him and Adams. Calhoun also opposed President Adams' plan to send a delegation to observe a meeting of South and Central American leaders in Panama, believing that the United States should stay out of foreign affairs. Calhoun became disillusioned with Adams' high-tariff policies and increased centralization of government through a network of internal improvements, which he now saw as a threat to the rights of the states. Calhoun wrote to Jackson on June 4, 1826, informing him that he would support Jackson's second campaign for the presidency in 1828. The two were never particularly close friends. Calhoun never fully trusted Jackson, a frontiersman and popular war hero, but hoped that his election would bring some reprieve from the Adams' anti-states rights policies. Jackson selected Calhoun as his running mate, and together they defeated Adams and his running mate Richard Rush. Calhoun thus became the second of two vice presidents to serve under two different presidents. The only other man who accomplished this feat was George Clinton, who served as vice president from 1805 to 1812 under Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. During the election, Jackson's aide James Alexander Hamilton attempted a rapprochement between Jackson and Crawford, whom Jackson resented partially due to the belief that he, not Calhoun, who had supported the invasion of Florida. Hamilton spoke about this prospect with Governor John Forsyth of Georgia, who acted as a mediator between the Jackson campaign and Crawford. Forsyth wrote a letter back to Hamilton in which he claimed that, after speaking with Crawford, Crawford stated that it was Calhoun, not him, who supported censuring Jackson for his invasion of Florida. Knowing that the letter could destroy the partnership, between Jackson and Calhoun, Hamilton and fellow aide William B. Lewis allowed it to remain in Hamilton's possession without informing Jackson or the public of its existence. Section 5.2 Petticoat Affair Early in Jackson's administration, Floride Calhoun organized cabinet wives, hence the term petticoats, against Peggy Eaton, wife of Secretary of War John Eaton, and refused to associate with her. They alleged that John and Peggy Eaton had engaged in an adulterous affair while she was still legally married to her first husband, and that her recent behavior was unladylike. The allegations of scandal created an intolerable situation for Jackson. The petticoat affair ended friendly relations between Calhoun and Jackson. Jackson sided with the Eatons. He and his late wife, Rachel Donaldson, had undergone similar political attacks stemming from their marriage in 1791. The two had married in 1791, not knowing that Rachel's first husband, Louis Robarts, had failed to finalize the expected divorce. Once the divorce was finalized, they married legally in 1794, but the episode caused a major controversy and was used against him in the 1828 campaign. Jackson saw attacks on Eaton stemming ultimately from the political opposition of Calhoun, who had failed to silence his wife's criticisms. The Calhouns were widely regarded as the chief instigators. Jackson, who loved to personalize disputes, also saw the petticoat affair as a direct challenge to his authority because it involved lower-ranking executive officials and their wives seeming to contest his ability to choose whomever he wanted for his cabinet. Secretary of State Martin Van Buren, a widower, took Jackson's side and defended the Edens. Van Buren was a northerner and supporter of the 1828 tariff, which Calhoun bitterly opposed. Calhoun and Van Buren were the main contenders for who would be nominated as vice president in the ensuing election, and who would then, presumably, be the party's cho choice to succeed Jackson. 
The fact that Van Buren sided with the Edens, in addition to disagreements between Jackson and Calhoun on a number of other issues, mainly the nullification process, marked him as Calhoun's likely vice presidential successor. Some historians, including Jackson biographers Richard B. Latner and Robert V. Remini, believe that the hostility towards the Edens was rooted less in questions of proper behavior than in politics. Eden had been in favor of the tariff of abominations. He was also politically close to Van Buren. Calhoun may have wanted to expel Eden from the cabinet as a way of boosting his anti-tariff agenda and increasing his standing in the Democratic Party. Many cabinet members were Southern and could be expected to sympathize with such concerns, especially Treasury Secretary Samuel D. Ingham, who was allied with Calhoun and believed that he, not Van Buren, should succeed Jackson as president. In 1830, reports had emerged accurately stating that Calhoun, as Secretary of War, had favored censuring Jackson for his 1818 invasion of Florida. These infuriated Jackson. Eventually, Lewis decided to reveal the existence of Forsythe's letter, and on April 30th, Crawford wrote a second letter, this time to Forsythe, repeating the charge Forsythe represented him as having previously made. Jackson received the letter on May 12th, which confirmed his suspicions. He claimed that Calhoun had betrayed him. Eden took his revenge on Calhoun. For reasons unclear, Calhoun asked Eaton to approach Jackson about the possibility of Calhoun publishing his correspondence with Jackson at the time of the Seminole War. Eden did nothing. This caused Calhoun to believe that Jackson had approved the publication of the letters. Calhoun published them in the United States Telegraph, a newspaper edited by a Calhoun protege, Duff Green. This gave the appearance of Calhoun trying to justify himself against a conspiracy to damage him and further enraged the presidency, president. Finally, in the spring of 1831, at the suggestion of Van Buren, who, like Jackson, supported the Eatons, Jackson replaced all but one of his cabinet members, thereby limiting Calhoun's influence. Van Buren began the process by resigning as Secretary of State, facilitating Jackson's removal of others. Van Buren thereby, thereby grew in favor with Jackson, while the rift between the President and Calhoun was widened. Later, in 1832, Calhoun, as Vice President, cast a tie-breaking vote against Jackson's nomination of Van Buren as Minister to Great Britain in a failed attempt to end Van Buren's political career. Missouri Senator Thomas Hart Benton, a staunch supporter of Jackson, then stated that Calhoun had elected a vice president, as Van Buren was able to move past his failed nomination as Minister to Great Britain and instead gain the Democratic Party's vice presidential election nomination in the 1832 election, in which he and Jackson were victorious. Section 5.3 Nullification Calhoun had begun to oppose tar tariff increases in, in protective tariffs, as they generally benefited Northerners more than Southerners. While he was Vice President in the Adams administration, Jackson's supporters devised a high tariff legislation that pr placed duties on imports that were also made in England. Calhoun had been assured that the Northern interests would reject the tariff of 1828, exposing pro-Adams New England congressmen to charges that they selfishly opposed legislation popular among Jacksonian Democrats in the West and Mid-Atlantic states. The Southern legislature, legislators miscalculated, and the so-called Tariff of Abominations passed and was signed into law by President Adams. Frustrated, Calhoun returned to his South Carolina plantation, where he anonymously composed South Carolina Exposition and Protest, an essay rejecting the centralization philosophy and supporting the pre principle of nullification as a means to prevent tyranny of a central government. Calhoun supported the idea of nullification through a concurrent majority. Nullification is a legal theory that a state has the right to nullify or invalidate any federal law it deems unconstitutional. In Calhoun's words, it is the right of a state to interpose in the last resort in order to wrest an unconstitutional act of the general government within its limits. Nullification can be traced back to arguments by Jefferson and Madison in writing the Kentucky and Virginia Resolutions of 1798 against this Alien and Sedition Acts. 
Madison expressed the hope that the states would declare the acts unconstitutional, while Jefferson explicitly endorsed nullification. Calhoun openly argued for a state's right to secede from the Union, as a last resort to protect its liberty and sovereignty. In his later years, Madison rebuked supporters of nullification, stating that no state had the right to nullify federal law. In South Carolina exposition and protest, Calhoun argued that a state could veto any federal law that went beyond the enumerated powers and encroached upon the residual powers of the state. President Jackson, meanwhile, generally supported states' rights, but opposed nullification and secession. At the 1830 Jefferson Day dinner at Jesse Brown's Indian Queen Hotel, Jackson proposed a toast and proclaimed, Our Federal Union, it must be preserved. Calhoun replied, The Union, next to our liberty, the most dear. May we all remember that it can only be preserved by respecting the rights of the states and distributing equally the benefit and burden of the Union. Calhoun's publication of letters from the Seminole and the Telegraph caused his relationship with Jackson to deteriorate further, thus contributing to the nullification crisis. Jackson and Calhoun began an angry correspondence that lasted until Jackson stopped it in July. On July 14, 1832, Jackson signed into law the Tariff of 1832. It was designed to placate the nullifiers by lowering tariff rates, but the nullifiers in South Carolina remained unsatisfied. In South Carolina exposition and protest, Calhoun argued that a state could veto any federal law that went beyond the enumerated powers and encroached upon the residual powers of the state. President Jackson, meanwhile, generally supported states' rights, but opposed nullification and secession. On July 14, 1832, Jackson signed into law the Tariff of 1832. It was designed to placate the nullifiers by lowering tariff rates, but the nullifiers in South Carolina remained unsatisfied. On November 24th, the South Carolina legislature officially nullified both the Tariff of 1832 and the Tariff of 1828, to be null and void as of February 1st, 1833. In response, Jackson sent U.S. Navy warships to Charleston Harbor and threatened to hang Calhoun or any man who worked to support nullification or secession. After joining the Senate, Calhoun began to work with Clay on a new compromise tariff. On November 24th, the South Carolina legislature officially nullified both the Tariff of 1832 and the Tariff of 1828 to be null and void as of February 1, 1833. In response, J Jackson sent U.S. Navy warships to Charleston Harbor and threatened to hang Calhoun or any man who worked to support nullification or secession. After joining the Senate, Calhoun began to work with Clay on a new compromise tariff. A bill sponsored by the administration had been introduced by Representative Julian Seaver Plank of New York, but it lowered rates more sharply than Clay and other protectionists desired. Clay managed to get Calhoun to agree to a bill with higher rates in exchange for Clay's opposition to Jackson's military threats and, perhaps, with the hope that he could win some Southern votes in his bid for the presidency. On the same day, Congress passed the Force Bill, which empowered the President of the United States to use military force to ensure state compliance with federal law. South Carolina accepted the tariff, but in, in a final show of defiance nullified the force bill. In Calhoun's speech against the force bill, delivered on February 5, 1833, no longer as vice president, he strongly endorsed nullification, at one point saying, Why then confer on the president the extensive and unlimited powers provided in this bill? Why authorize him to use military force to arrest the civil process of the set state? But one answer could be given, that in a contest between the state and general government, if the resistance be limited on both sides to the civil process, the state, by its inherent sovereignty, stands upon its reserved powers, will provide too powerful in such a controversy, and must triumph over the federal government, sustained by its delegated and limited authority. And in this answer, we have an acknowledgment of the truth of those great principles which the state has so firmly and nobly contended. In his three volume biography of Jackson, James Parton summed up Calhoun's role in the nullification crisis. Calhoun began it, Calhoun continued it, Calhoun stopped it. Section 5.4 Resignation 
As tensions over nullification escalated, South Carolina Ro Senator Robert H. Hayne was considered less capable than Calhoun to represent South Carolina in the Senate debates. So in late 1832, Hayne resigned to become governor. The South Carolina legislature elected Calhoun as his replacement. On December 28th, Calhoun resigned as vice president to become a senator, with a voice in the debates. Van Buren had already been elected as Jackson's new vice president, meaning that Calhoun had less than three months left on his term anyway. The South Carolina newspaper City Gazette commented on the change. It is admitted that the former gentleman, Hayne, is injudiciously pitted against Clay and Webster, and, nullification out of the question, Mr. Calhoun's place should be in front with these formidable politicians. Biographer John Niven argues that these moves were part of a well-thought-out plan whereby Hayne would retain, restrain the hotheads in the state legislature and Calhoun would defend his brainchild nullification in Washington against administration stalwarts and the likes, likes of Daniel Webster, the new apostle of northern nationalism. Calhoun was the first of two vice presidents to resign, the second being Spiro Agnew in 1973. During his terms as vice president, he made a record 31 tie-breaking tie votes in Congress. Section 6. First Term in the Senate When Calhoun took his seat in the Senate on December 29, 1832, his chances of becoming president were considered poor due to his involvement in the nullification crisis, which left him without connections to a na major national party. After implementation of the Compromise Tariff of 1833, which helped solve the nullification crisis, the Nullifier Party, along with other anti-Jackson politicians, formed a coalition known as the Whig Party. Calhoun sometimes affiliated with the Whigs, but chose to remain a virtual independent due to Whig promotion of federally subsidized internal improvements. From 1833 to 1834, Jackson was engaged in removing federal funds from the Second Bank of the United States during the Bank War. Calhoun opposed this action, considering it a dangerous expansion of executive power. He called the men of the Jackson administration artful, cunning, and corrupt politicians, and not fearless warriors. He accused Jackson of being ignorant on financial matters. As evidence, he cited the economic panic caused by Nicholas Biddle as a means to stop Jackson from destroying the bank. On March 28, 1834, Calhoun voted with the Whig senators on a successful motion to censure Jackson for his removal of the funds. In 1837, he refused to attend the inauguration of Jackson's chosen successor, Van Buren, even as other powerful senators who opposed the administration, such as Webster and Clay, did witness the inauguration. However, by 1837, Calhoun had generally realigned himself with most of the Democrats', Democrats policies. To restore his national stature, Calhoun cooperated with Van Buren. Democrats were hostile to national banks, and the country's bankers had joined the Whig Party. The Democratic replacement, meant to help combat the Panic of 1837, was the independent treasury system, which Calhoun supported and which went into effect. Calhoun, like Jackson and Van Buren, attacked finance capitalism and opposed what he saw as encroachment by government and big business. For this reason, he opposed the candidacy of Whig William Henry Harrison in the 1840 presidential election, believing that Harrison would institute high tariffs and therefore place an undue burden on the southern economy. Calhoun resigned from the Senate on March 3, 1843, four years before the expiration of his term, and returned to Fort Hill to prepare an attempt to win the Democratic nomination for the 1844 presidential election. He gained little support even from the South and quit. Section 7. Secretary of State. Section 7.1. Appointment and the Annexation of Texas. When Harrison died in 1841 after a month in office, Pre Vice President John Tyler succeeded him. Tyler, a former Democrat, was expelled from the Whig Party after vetoing bills passed by the Whig Congressional Majority to reestablish a national bank and raise tariffs. He named Calhoun Secretary of State on April 10, 1844, following the death of April B. Upshur in the USS Princeton disaster. Upshur's loss was a severe blow to the Tyler administration. 
When Calhoun was nominated as Upshur's replacement, the White House was well advanced towards securing a treaty of annexation with Texas. The State Department's secret negotiations with the Texas Republic had proceeded despite explicit threats from a suspicious Mexican government that an unauthorized seizure of its northern district of Coahuila y Tejas would be equivalent to an act of war. Both the negotiations with Texas envoys and the garnering of support from the U.S. Senate had been spearheaded aggressively by Secretary Upshur, a strong pro-slavery partisan. Tyler looked to its ratification by the Senate as a sine qua non to his uh, ambition for another term in office. Tyler planned to outflank the Whigs by gaining support from the Democratic Party or possibly creating a new party of discontented Northern Democrats and Southern Whigs. Calhoun, although as avid a proponent for Texas acquisition as Upshur, posed a political liability to Tyler's aims. As Secretary of State, Calhoun's political objective was to see that the presidency was placed in the hands of a southern extremist who had put the expansion of slavery at the center of national policy. Tyler and his allies had, since 1843, devised and encouraged national propaganda promoting Texas annexation, which understated southern slaveholders' aspirations regarding the future of Texas. Instead, Tyler chose to portray the annexation of Texas as something that would prove economically benefit, beneficial to the nation as a whole. The further introduction of slavery into the vast expanses of Texas and beyond, they argued, would diffuse rather than concentrate slavery regionally, ultimately weakening white attachment and dependence on slave labor. This theory was yoked to the growing enthusiasm among Americans for manifest destiny, a desire to see the social, economic, and moral precepts of republicanism spread across the continent. Moreover, Tyler declared that national security was at stake. If foreign powers, Great Britain in particular, were to gain influence in Texas, it would be reduced to a British cotton-producing reserve and a base to exert geostrategic influence over North America. Texas might be coerced into relinquishing slavery, inducing slave uprisings in, in adjoining slave states, and deepening sectional conflicts between American free soil and slave soil interests. The appointment of Calhoun with a southern state's rights reputation, which some believed was synonymous with slavery, threatened to cast doubt on Tyler's carefully crafted reputation as a nationalist. Tyler, though ambivalent, felt obliged to enlist Calhoun as Secretary of State because Tyler's closest confidants had, in haste, offered the position to the South Carolina statesman in the immediate aftermath of the Princeton disaster. Calhoun would be confirmed by Congress by unanimous vote. In advance of Calhoun's arrival in Washington, D.C., Tyler attempted to quickly finalize the treaty negotiations. Sam Houston, president of the Texas Republic, fearing Mexican retaliation, insisted on a tangible demonstration of U.S. commitments to the Secretary of Security of Texas. When key Texas diplomats failed to appear on schedule, the delay compelled Tyler to bring his new Secretary of State directly into negotiations. Secretary Calhoun was directed to honor former Secretary Upshur's verbal assurances of protection, now offered by Calhoun in writing, to provide for U.S. military intervention in the event that Mexico used force to hold Texas. Tyler deployed U.S. Navy vessels to the Gulf of Mexico and ordered Army units mobilized, entirely paid for with $100,000 of executive branch contingency funds. The move sidestepped constitutional requirements that Congress authorize appropriations for war. On April 22, 1844, Secretary Calhoun signed the annexation and ten days later delivered it to the Senate for consideration in secret session. The details of the treaty negotiations and supporting documents were leaked to the press by Senator Benjamin Tappan of Ohio. Tappan, a Democrat, was an opponent of annexation and of slavery. The terms of the Tyler-Texas Treaty and the release of Calhoun's letter to British Ambassador Richard Packingham exposed the annexation campaign as a program to expand and preserve slavery. In the Packingham letter, Calhoun alleged that the institution of slavery contributed to the physical and mental well-being of southern slaves. 
the U.S. Senate was compelled to open its debates on ratification to public scrutiny, and hopes for its passage by the two-thirds majority required by the Constitution were abandoned by administration supporters. In linking Texas annexation to the expansion of slavery, Calhoun had alienated many who might previously have supported the treaty. On June 8, 1844, after fierce partisan struggles, the Senate rejected the Tyler-Texas Treaty by a vote of 35 to 16, a margin of more than 2 to 1. The vote went largely along party lines. Whigs had opposed it almost unanimously, 1 to 27, while Democrats split, but lo voted largely in favor, 15 to 8. Nevertheless, the disclosure of the treaty placed the issue of Texas annexation at the center of the 1844 general election. Section 7.2 Election of 1844 At the Democratic Convention in Baltimore, Maryland, in May 1844, Calhoun's supporters, with Calhoun's attendance, threatened to bolt the proceedings and shift support to Tyler's third-party ticket if the delegates fail to produce a pro-Texas nominee. Calhoun's Pakenham letter and its identification with pro-slavery extremism moved the presumptive Democratic Party nominee, the Northerner Martin Van Buren, into denouncing annexation. Therefore, Van Buren, already not widely popular in the South, saw his support from that region crippled. As a result, James K. Polk, a pro-Texas Jacksonian and Tennessee politician, won the nomination. Historian Daniel Walker Howe says that Calhoun's Pakenham letter was a deliberate attempt to influence the outcome of the 1844 election, writing, By identifying Texas with slavery, Calhoun made sure that Van Buren, being a northerner, would have to oppose Texas. This, Calhoun correctly foresaw, would hurt the New Yorker's chances for the Democratic nomination, nor did Carolinian's ingenious strategy ultimately wreck the cause for Texas annexation. Indeed, in that respect, it would turn out a brilliant success. In the general election, Calhoun offered his endorsement to Polk on condition that he support the annexation of Texas, oppose the tariff of 1842, and dissolve the Washington Globe, the semi-official propaganda organ of the Democratic Party headed by Francis Preston Blair. He received these assurances and enthusiastically supported Polk's candidacy. Polk narrowly defeated Clay, who opposed annexation. Lame duck President Tyler organized a joint House-Senate vote on the Texas Treaty, which passed, requiring only a simple majority. He signed a bill of annexation on March 1st. With Pol President Polk's support, the Texas Annexation Treaty was appro approved by the Texas Republican in, Republic in 1845. A bill to admit Texas as the 28th state of the Union was signed by Polk on December 29, 1845. Section 8, Second Term in the Senate. Section 8.1, Mexican-American War and Wilmot Proviso. Calhoun was re-elected to the Senate in 1845 following the resignation of Daniel Elliott Huger. He soon became vocally opposed to the Mexican-American War. He believed that it would distort the national character by undermining re republicanism in favor of empire and by bringing non-white persons into the country. When Congress declared war against Mexico on May 13th, he abstained from voting on the measure. Calhoun also vigorously opposed the Wilmot Proviso, a 1946 proposal by Pennsylvania Representative David Wilmot to ban slavery in all newly acquired territories. The House of Representatives, through its northern majority, passed the provision several times. However, the Senate, where non-slave and slave states had more equal representation, never passed the measure. Section 8.2, Oregon Boundary Dispute. A major crisis emerged from the persistent Oregon boundary dispute between Great Britain and the United States due to an increasing number of American migrants. The territory included most of present-day British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. American expansionists used the slogan 5440 or fight in reference to the northern boundary coordinates of the Oregon Territory. The parties compromised ending the war threat by splitting the area down the middle at the 49th parallel, 
with the British acquiring British Columbia and the Americans accepting Washington and Oregon. Calhoun, along with President Polk and Secretary of State James Buchanan, continued work on the treaty while he was a senator, and it was ratified by a vote of 41 to 14 on June 18, 1846. Section 8.3, Rejection of the Compromise of 1850. The Compromise of 1850, devised by Clay and Stephen A. Douglas, the first term Democratic senator from Illinois, was designed to solve the controversy over the status of slavery in the vast new territories acquired from Mexico. Many pro-slavery Southerners opposed it, and Calhoun helped organize preparations for the Nashville Convention, which would meet that summer to discuss the possibility of Southern secession. The nearly 68-year-old Calhoun had suffered periodic bouts of tuberculosis throughout his life. In May 1850, the disease reached a critical stage. Weeks from death and too feeble to speak, Calhoun wrote a blistering attack on the Compromise that would become likely his most famous speech. On May 4th, a friend, Senator James Mason of Virginia, read the remarks. Calhoun affirmed the right of the South to leave the Union in response to Northern subjugation. He warned that the day the balance between the two sections was destroyed would be a day not far removed from disunion, anarchy, and civil war. Calhoun queried how the Union might be preserved in light of subjugation by the stronger party against the weaker one. He maintained the responsibility of solving the question lay entirely on the North, as the stronger section, to allow the Southern minority an equal share in governance, and to cease the agitation. He added, If you who represent the stronger portion cannot agree to settle them on the broad principle of justice and duty, say so, and let the states we both represent agree to separate and pardon peace. If you are unwilling, we should pardon peace, tell us so, and we shall know what to do when you reduce the question to submission or resistance. Calhoun died soon afterwards, and although the compromise measures did eventually pass, Calhoun's ideas about states' rights attracted increasing attention across the South. Historian William Barney argues that Calhoun's idea proved appealing to Southerners concerned with preserving slavery. Southern radicals known as fire eaters pushed the doctrine of states' rights to its logical extreme by upholding the constitutional right of the state to secede. Section 9. Death and Burial Calhoun died at the Old Brick Capitol boarding house in Washington, D.C. on March 31, 1850, of tuberculosis at the age of 68. He was interred at the St. Philip's Churchyard in Charleston, South Carolina. During the Civil War, a group of Calhoun's friends were concerned about the possible destruction of his grave by federal troops and, during the night, removed his coffin to a hiding place under the stairs of the church. The next night, the coffin was buried in an unmarked grave near the church, where it remained until 1871, when it was exhumed again and returned to its original place. After Calhoun had died, an associate suggested that Senator Thomas Hart Benton give a eulogy in honor of Calhoun on the floor of the Senate. Benton, a devoted Unionist, declined, saying, He is not dead, sir. He is not dead. There may be no vitality in his body, but there is in his doctrines. Calhoun's widow, Floride, died on July 25, 1866, and was buried in St. Paul's Episcopal Church Cemetery in Pendleton, South Carolina, near their children, but apart from her husband. Section 10, Political Philosophy. Section 10.1, Agrarian Republicanism. Historian Lee H. Cheek, Jr. distinguishes between two strands of American republicanism, the Puritan tradition, based in New, New England, and the agrarian or South Atlantic tradition, which Cheek argues was espoused by Calhoun. While the New England tradition stressed a politically centralized enforcement of moral and religious norms to secure civic virtue, the South Atlantic tradition relied on a decentralized moral and religious order based on the subsidiarity, or localism. Cheek maintains that the Kentucky and Virginia Resolution, 1798, written by Jefferson and Madison, were the cornerstones of Calhoun's republicanism. Calhoun emphasized the primacy of subsidiarity holding that 
popular rule is best expressed in local communities that are nearly autonomous while serving as units of a larger society. Section 10.2 Slavery Calhoun led the pro-slavery faction in the Senate, opposing both total abolitionism and attempts such as the Wilmot Proviso to limit the expansion of slavery into the Western territories. Calhoun's father, Patrick Calhoun, helped shape his son's political views. He was a staunch supporter of slavery, who taught his son that social standing depended not merely on a commitment to the ideal of popular self-government, but also on the ownership of a substantial number of slaves. Flourishing in a world in which slaveholding was a hallmark of civilization, Calhoun saw little reason to question its morality as an adult. He further believed that slavery instilled in the remaining whites a code of honor that blunted the disruptive potential of private gain and fostered the civic-mindedness that lay near the core of the Republican creed. From such a standpoint, the expansion of slavery decreased the likelihood of social conflict and postponed the declension when money would become the only measure of self-worth, as it happened in New England. Calhoun was thus firmly convinced that slavery was the key to the success of the American dream. Whereas other so Southern politicians had, excluded, has, had excuted, excused slavery as a necessary evil, in a famous speech on the Senate floor, on February 6, 1837, Calhoun asserted that slavery was a positive good. He rooted this claim on two grounds, white supremacy and paternalism. All societies, Calhoun claimed, are ruled by an elite group that enjoys the fruits of the labor of a less exceptional group. Senator William Cabell Rives of, New of Virginia earlier had referred to slavery as an evil that might become a lesser evil in some circumstances. Calhoun believed that conceded too much to the abolitionists. I take higher ground. I argued that in the present state of civilization, where two races of different origin and distinguished by color and other physical differences, as well as intellectual, are brought together, the relation now existing in the slaveholding states between the two is, instead of an evil, a good, a positive good. I may say with truth that in few countries so much is left to the share of the laborer, and so little exacted from him, or where there is more kind attention paid to him in sickness or infirmities of age. Compare his condition with the tenants of the poor houses in the more civilized portions of Europe. Look at the sick and the old and infirm slave on one hand, in the midst of his family and friends, under the kind superintending care of his master and mistress, and compare it with the forlorn and wretched condition of the pauper in the poorhouse. I hold, then, that there has never yet existed a wealthy and civilized society in which one portion of the community did not, in, in point of fact, live on the labor of the other. Calhoun rejected the belief of Southern leaders such as Henry Clay that all Americans could agree on the opinion and feeling that slavery was wrong, although they might disagree on the most practicable way to respond to that great wrong. Calhoun's constitutional ideas acted as a viable conservative alternative to Northern appeals to democracy, majority rule, and natural rights. As well as providing the intellectual justification of slavery, Calhoun played a central role in devising the South's overall political strategy. According to Phillips, organi organization and strategy were widely demanded in Southern defense, and Calhoun came to be regarded as the main source of plans, arguments, and inspiration. His devices were manifold, to suppress agitation, to praise the slaveholding system, to promote white Southern prosperity and expansion, to procure a Western alliance, to frame a fresh plan of government by concurrent majorities, to form a Southern bloc, to warn the North of the dangers of Southern desperation, to appeal for Northern magnanimity as indispensable for the saving of the Union. Shortly after delivering his speech against the Compromise of 1850, Calhoun predicted the destruction of the Union over the slavery issue. Speaking to Senator Mason, he said, I fix its probable occurrence within 12 years or three presidential terms. You and others of your age will probably live to see it. I shall not. The mode by which it will be done is not so clear. It may be brought about in a manner that no one now foresees, but the probably, probability is it will explode in a presidential election. Section 10.3, The Evils of War and Political Parties Calhoun was constantly opposed to the war with Mexico, arguing that an enlarged military effort would only feed the alarming 
and growing lust of the public for empire, regardless of its constitutional dangers, bloat executive powers and patronage, and saddle the republic with a soaring debt that would disrupt finances and encourage speculation. Calhoun feared, moreover, that southern slave owners would be shut out of any conquered Mexican territories, as nearly happened with the Wilmot Proviso. He argued that the war would detrimentally lead to the annexation of all of Mexico, which would bring Mexicans into a into the country whom he considered deficient in moral and intellectual terms. He said in a speech on January 4, 1848, We make a great mistake, sir, when we suppose that all people are capable of self-government. We are anxious to force free government on all, and I see that it has been urged in a very respectable quarter, that it is the mission of this country to spread civil and religious liberty all over all the world, and especially over this continent. It is a great mistake. None but people advanced to a very high state of moral and intellectual improvement are capable, in a civilized state, of maintaining free government, and amongst those who are so purified, very few indeed have had the good fortune of forming a constitution capable of endurance. Anti-slavery Northerners denounced the war as a Southern conspiracy to expand slavery. Calhoun in turn perceived a connivance of Yankees to destroy the South. By 1847, he decided the Union was threatened by a totally corrupt party system. He believed that in their lust for office, patronage, and spoils, politicians in the North pandered to the anti-slavery vote, especially during presidential campaigns, and politicians in the slave states sacrificed Southern rights in an effort to placate the Northern wings of their parties. Thus, the essential first step in any successful assertion of Southern rights had to be the jettisoning of all party ties. In 1848-49, to 49, Calhoun tried to give substance to his call for Southern unity. He was the driving force behind the drafting and publication of the address of the Southern delegates in Congress to their constituents. It alleged Northern violations of the constitutional rights of the South, then warned Southern voters to expect forced emancipation of slaves in the near future, followed by their complete subjugation by an unholy alliance of unprincipled Northerners and Blacks. Whites would flee, and the South would become the permanent abode of disorder, anarchy, poverty, misery, and wretchedness. Only the immediate and unflinching unity of Southern whites could prevent such a disaster. Such unity would either bring the North to its senses or lay the foundation for an independent South. But the spirit of union was still strong in the region, and fewer than 40% of the Southern congressmen signed the address, and only one Whig. Many Southerners believed his warnings and read every political news story from the North as further evidence of the planned destruction of the white Southern way of life. The climax came a decade over Calhoun's death with the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860, which led to the secession of South Carolina, followed by six other southern states. They formed the new Confederate states, which, in accordance with Calhoun's theory, did not have any organized political parties. Section 10.4, Concurrent Majority Calhoun's basic concern for protecting the diversity of minority interests is expressed in his chief contribution to political science, the idea of a concurrent majority across different groups as distinguished from a numerical majority. A concurrent majority is a system in which a minority group is permitted to exercise a sort of veto power over actions of a majority that are believed to infringe upon the minority's rights. According to the principle of numerical majority, the will of the more numerous citizens should always rule, regardless of the burdens on the minority. Such a principle tends toward a consolidation of power, in which the interests of the absolute majority always prevail over those of the minority. Calhoun believed that the great advancement of the American Constitution was in checking the tyranny of a numerical majority through institutional procedures that required a concurrent majority, such that each important interest in the community must consent to the actions of government. To secure a concurrent majority, those interests that have a numerical majority must compromise with the interests that are in the minority. A concurrent majority requires a unanimous consent of all the major interests in the community, which is the only sure way of preventing tyranny of the majority. This idea supported Calhoun's doctrine of interposition or nullification, in which the state governments could refuse to enforce or comply with the policy of the federal government that threatened the vital interests of the states. Historian Richard Hofstadter 
in 1948 emphasized that Calhoun's conception of minority was very different from the minorities of a century later. Not in the slightest was Calhoun concerned with minority rights as they are chiefly of interest to the modern liberal mind. The rights of dissenters to express unorthodox opinions of the individual conscience against the state, least of all ethnic minorities. At bottom, he was not interested in any minority that was not a propriety minority. The concurrent majority itself was a device without relevance to the protection of dissent designed to protect a vested interest of considerable power. The, it was minority privileges rather than minority rights that he really proposed to protect. Unlike Jefferson, Calhoun rejected attempts at economic, social, or political leveling, claiming that true equality could not be achieved if all classes were given equal rights and responsibilities. Rather, to ensure true prosperity, it was necessary for a stronger group to provide protection and care for the weaker one. This meant that the two groups should not be equal before the law. For Calhoun, protection or order was more important than freedom. Individual rights were something to be earned, not something bestowed by nature or God. Calhoun was concerned with protecting the interests of the southern states, which he identified with the interests of their slaveholding elites, as a distinct and beleaguered minority among the members of the Federal Union. His idea of a concurrent majority as a protection for minority rights has gained some acceptance in American political thought. Political scientist Malcolm Jewell argues, the decision-making process in this country resembles John Calhoun's concurrent majority. A large number of groups both within and outside the government must, in practice, approve any major policy. Calhoun's ideas on the concurrent majority are illustrated in a disquisition on government. The disquisition is a 100-page essay on Calhoun's definitive and comprehensive ideas on government, which he worked on intermittently for six years until its 1849 completion. It systematically presents his arguments that a numerical majority in any government will typically impose a despotism over a minority unless some way is devised to secure the assent of all classes, sections, and interests. And similarly, that innate human depravity would debase government in a democracy. Section 10.5, State Sovereignty and the Calhoun Doctrine. In the 1840s, three interpretations of the constitutional powers of Congress to deal with slavery in territories emerged. The Free Soil Doctrine, the Popular Sovereignty Position, and the Calhoun Doctrine. The Free Soilers stated that Congress had the power to outlaw slavery in the territories. The Popular Sovereignty Position argued that the voters living there should decide. The Calhoun Doctrine stated that Congress and the citizens of the territories could never outlaw slavery in the territories. In what historian Robert R. Russell calls the Calhoun Doctrine, Calhoun argued that the federal government's role in the territories was only that of the trustee or agent of the several sovereign states. It was obliged not to discriminate among the states and hence was incapable of forbidding the bringing into any territory of anything that was legal property in any state. Calhoun argued that citizens from every state had the right to take their property to any territory. Congress and local voters, he asserted, had no authority to place restrictions on slavery in the territories. In a February 1847 speech before the Senate, Calhoun declared that the enactment of any law which should directly or by its effects deprive the citizens of any of the states of this Union from emigrating with their property into any of the territories of the United States will make such discrimination and would therefore be a violation of the Constitution. Enslavers therefore had a fundamental right to take their property where they wished. As constitutional historian Herman Van Holtz noted, Calhoun's doctrine made it a solemn constitutional duty of the United States government and of the American people to act as if the existence or non-existence of slavery in the territories did not concern them in the least. The Calhoun doctrine was opposed by the Free Soil forces, which merged into the new Republican Party around 1854. Chief Justice Roger B. Taney based his decision in the 1857 Supreme Court case Dred Scott v. Sanford in which he ruled that the federal government could not prohibit slavery in any of the territories upon Calhoun's arguments. Moderates rejected these beliefs and Taney's decision became a major point of partisan attack by the Republican Party. Section 11, Legacy. Section 11.1, Monuments and Memorials. In 1817, surveyors sent by Secretary of War John Calhoun 
to map the area around Fort Snelling, named the largest lake in what became Minneapolis, Minnesota for him. Two centuries later, the city of Man Mini Minneapolis renamed Lake Calhoun with the Dakota language name Badenakaska, meaning White Earth Lake or White Banks Lake. The government, the Confederate government honored Calhoun on a one-cent postage stamp, which was printed in 1862, but was never officially released. The Clemson University campus in South Carolina occupies the site of Calhoun's Fort Hill Plantation, which he bequeathed to his wife and daughter. They sold it and its 50 slaves to a relative. When that owner died, Thomas Green Clemson foreclosed the mortgage. He later bequeathed the property to the state for use as an agricultural college to be named after him. Calhoun County, Kansas renamed itself Jackson County in 1859. Many different places, streets, and schools were named after Calhoun, as may be seen on the list cited above. The immortal trio, Calhoun, Daniel Webster, and Henry Clay, were memorialized with streets in uptown New Orleans. Calhoun Landing on the Santee Cooper River in Santee, South Carolina, was named after him. In 1887, a monument to Calhoun was erected in Marion Square, Charleston. It was not well liked by the residents and was replaced in 1896 by a different monument that still stands. The USS John C. Calhoun, in commission from 1963 to 1994, was a fleet ballistic missile nuclear submarine. The Calhoun Isles Community Bank Band in the Uptown District of Minneapolis, Minnesota, changed its name to City of Lakes Community Band in in November 2018 to distance itself from Calhoun's pro-slavery legacy. This followed the renaming of the former Lake Calhoun in Minneapolis to Bede Makaska, the traditional Dakota name for the lake. Section 11.2 Film and Television Calhoun was portrayed by actor Arliss Howard in the 1997 film Amistad. The film depicts the controversy and legal battle surrounding the status of slaves who in 1980, 1839 rebelled against their transporters on La Amistad slave ship. Section 11.3 Historical Reputation Calhoun was despised by Jackson and his supporters for his alleged attempts to subvert the unity of the nation for his own political gain. On his deathbed, Jackson regretted that he had not had Calhoun executed for treason. My country, he declared, would have sustained me in the act, and his fate would have been a warning to traitors in all time to come. Even after his death, Calhoun's reputation among Jacksonians remained poor. They disparaged him by portraying him as a man thirsty for power, who, when, failed to, when he failed to attain it, sought to tear down his country with him. According to Parton, writing in 1860, the old Jackson men of the inner set still speak of Mr. Calhoun in terms which show that they consider him at once the most wicked and the most despicable of American statesmen. He was a coward, conspirator, hypocrite, traitor, and fool, say they. He drove, strove, schemed, dreamed, lived only for the presidency, and when he despaired of reaching that office through honorable means, he sought to rise upon the ruins of his country, thinking it better to reign in South Carolina than to serve in the United States. General Jackson lived and died in this opinion. Calhoun is often remembered for his defense of minority rights in the context of defending white Southern interests from perceived Northern threats by use of the concurrent majority. He is also noted and criticized for his strong defense of slavery. These positions played an enormous role in influencing Southern secessionist leaders by strengthening the trend of sectionalism, thus contributing to the Civil War. During his lifetime and after, Calhoun was seen as one of the Senate's most important figures. In 1957, a Senate committee chaired by John F. Kennedy selected Calhoun as one of the five greatest senators in history. Biographer Irving Bartlett wrote, Posterity decided against Calhoun's argument for the indefinite protection of slavery more than 130 years ago. What he had to say about the need in popular governments like our own to protect the rights of minorities, about the importance of choosing leaders with character, talent, and the willingness to speak hard truths to the people, and about the enduring need in a vast and various country like our own for the people themselves to develop and sustain both the civic culture and the institutional structures which contribute to their lasting interest is as fresh and significant as it was in 1850. 
Calhoun is often held in high regard by the Southern Lost Cause historians, who hold a romanticized view of the old Southern way of life and its cause during the Civil War. Historians such as Charles M. Wilkes, Margaret Coit, and Clyde N. Wilson have, in their writings, portrayed Calhoun as a sympathetic or heroic figure. John Niven portrayed paints a portrait of Calhoun that is both sympathetic and tragic. He says that Calhoun's ambition and personal desires were often thwarted by lesser men than he. Niven identifies Calhoun as a driven man and a tragic figure. He argues that Calhoun was motivated by the near disaster of the War of 1812, of which he was a thoughtless advocate, to work towards fighting for the freedoms and securities of the white southern people against any kind of threat. Ultimately, Niven says, he would overcompensate and in the end would more than any other individual destroy the culture he sought to preserve, perpetuating for several generations the very insecurity that shaped his public career. Recently, Calhoun's reputation has suffered particularly due to his defense of slavery. The racially motivated Charleston Church shooting in South Carolina in June 2015 reinvigorated demands for the removal of monuments dedicated to prominent pro-slavery and Confederate States figures. That month, the monument to Calhoun in Charleston was found vandalized, with spray-painted denunciation of Calhoun as a racist and a defender of slavery. In response to decades of requests, Yale President Peter Salovey announced that the university's Calhoun College will be renamed in 2017 to honor Grace Murray Hopper, a pioneering computer programmer, mathematician, and Navy Rear Admiral who graduated from Yale. Calhoun is commemorated elsewhere on campus, excluding the exteri including the exterior of Harkness Tower, a prominent campus landmark, as one of Yale's eight worthies. In Calhoun's defense, Clyde Wilson, editor of the multi-volume The Papers of John C. Calhoun and a distinguished chair of the Abbeville Institute argued, your ordinary run-of-the-mill historian will tell you that John C. Calhoun, having defended the bad and lost causes of states' rights and slavery, deserves to rest forever in the dustbin of history. Nothing could be further from the truth. No American public figure, after the generation of the Founding Fathers, has more to say to later times than Calhoun. This is because he was a statesman, that is, he was a thinker of permanent interest as well as an actor on the political stage. Calhoun himself often drew attention to the differences between a statesman and a politician. A statesman takes a long view of the future welfare of his people and says what he believes to be true, even if the citizens prefer not to hear it. A politician says what he thinks um, will make him popular and not offend the voters and the media. His span of attention is short-term, the next poll and the next suitcase full of cash.